Good morning, everyone. Blessed Easter to you. Today, I'll be sharing God's word with you from the comfort of my own home. But before we begin, let's open a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you be with us. Uh, help us to know your presence, O oh Lord, even this Easter morning. Holy Spirit, we call upon you to join us as one heart, even as we listen to your word. And Jesus, keep our eyes on you, even as we contemplate your death and your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, earlier this week, Singapore implemented the circuit breaker, and there have been a lot of changes as we have to deal with massive changes in our own lives. Many of us, we have to work from home, and if you have kids, the kids will be with you for 24-7. We can't go out, there's, you know, unless you have to buy some groceries, and there's this constant atmosphere of fear whenever you're outside. And there's frustration, even as we see ourselves being trapped within our own home. As COVID-19 continues to spread, global economy is affected, global recession, stock markets are crashing, we see the news of people dying every day all over the world. And even here in Singapore, every day we receive the news of hundreds of people who are being infected on a daily basis. We are now in a state of constant confusion, frustration and fear. Life is also getting harder because of the circuit breaker and it seems as though we, we can't control the situation, we can't control even our families. And these are the times where, you know, we sometimes we look back, we turn around, we look at things which we are familiar with, things which we are confident, confident with in the past, things that we can control. The question is, you know, have we actually reverted back to the old ways of thinking, the old patterns of behavior? And we know we shouldn't because these behaviors sometimes, they are sinful behavior, or it distracts us away from our walk with God. But somehow when you know when the future seems uncertain it seems easier to go back and do things go back and take control of certain situation than it is to press on well today our text takes us to john chapter 21 verse 1 to 19 and here we you can actually see the encounter uh, between jesus and the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee. And now verse 14, we know that this is actually the third encounter that the disciples have with Jesus after he was resurrected on Easter Sunday. Now the first encounter with Jesus was on Easter Day itself. The disciples, they were all in Jerusalem. They were fearful of persecution by the Jews like us. They were all hiding, you know, hiding in, in one locked house when Jesus appeared in their midst and he said, Peace be with you. Now the second encounter actually happened eight days later where the disciples were once again hiding in the locked room when Jesus appeared and he told Thomas to touch his wounds. Now the third encounter was far away from home, far away from Jerusalem, rather. And this time instead of finding the disciples in the locked room in Jerusalem, we found them by the Sea of Tiberias, which is about 128 kilometers north of Jerusalem. And verse 2 of chapter 21 says this, Simon Peter, Thomas, called a twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. Now these disciples, seven of them, seem to have gone home. They have gone back to fishing. They have moved from the empty tomb of Christ to their boats, from the house in Jerusalem to the waters by the Sea of Tiberias, where most of them would have been very familiar with, having been grown up as fishermen. Now, let's just pause for a while and imagine ourselves as the disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, the first time the disciples would have heard the news of Jesus being resurrected would have been from the women who visited Jesus too. You know, there was an account of this 
uh, you know, in, in Luke 24 and in Mark 16, and it was written there that the disciples they don't believe them, you know, and they call it an ideal tale. And even when Jesus appeared to two men, okay, no longer women, but men who were heading to Emmaus from Jerusalem, and Jesus opened up their eyes to reveal that he is the risen Lord, the eleven disciples of Jesus Christ, they don't believe them. So what happened? Subsequently, Jesus appeared to them twice. And Jesus even rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Okay, in one incident, and in the other incident, he actually told them, stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And this, we know, will be the coming of the Holy Spirit on them. So, we are not there yet, right? The story is not there yet. We are, no longer, we are not at X yet. And the question is, why are the disciples here? You know, miles and miles away from Jerusalem, why were they here at the Sea of Tiberias fishing? Verse 2 tells us that, you know, this was initiated by Peter. Right? Peter says, I'm going fishing. And then the rest of them follow him. So why did Peter initiate this? And why did he go fishing? Now we need to refresh our memory a little bit about Peter. Now Peter and his brother Andrew, along with James and, and John, they were the first set of disciples that Jesus has called out to them to be fishers of men. And, and they left everything, you know, and they followed him for three whole years. And Peter was very close to, to Jesus. He was one of the inner circle, right? Inner circle who witnessed a lot of miracles, major events, okay, such as the rising of Jairus' uh, daughter from the dead, uh, the transfiguration of Christ on the mount, and Jesus' prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter is also the only one who rightly identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And his name, Jesus renamed for him from Simon to Peter. Peter was the only brave disciple who dared to demonstrate his loyalty and willingness to do anything that Jesus does, you know, even attempting to walk on the sea like Jesus. He is the disciple, okay, who proclaimed in John chapter 13, verse 37, that if he must die with Jesus, that even if, he's, even if he were to die with Jesus, he will never, never, ever deny Christ. He will never, never deny Jesus Christ. Okay. But we kind of knew, you know, how that turned out, right? Peter, this, this leader, you know, among all the apostles, uh, the leader among all the disciples, Okay, he denied Jesus Christ three times before the rooster crow, just as what Jesus has predicted. And the Gospel of Luke actually included this uh, little detail here, and he said, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. The Lord turn and look at Peter and Peter remember now I've always wondered you know what did Peter see in Jesus eyes what did Peter see was it a I told you so kind of look you know I, I kind of predicted that you do this Peter was it a, was Jesus like smirking at, at Peter I, I don't think so was Jesus angry at Peter then you know was his eyes filled with with anger and hatred. But, you know, knowing the person of Jesus through the Gospels, knowing how Jesus reacts with love and compassion even to Judas, I don't think so too. Well, then, can it be a hurt feeling, you know, a hurt kind of look? Like, how can you have, how could you have done this, Peter? Was, was it this kind of look? Well, Jesus already knew, you know, what was going to happen. And I don't think, you know, there was a look to show that he was hurt. You know, Jesus wasn't trying to cute trick Peter. So no, I don't think so as well. But what I believe is that the look was a look of pure, undiluted and sincere love for Peter. This is a look which Peter cannot bear to see in his sin. You know, when we have sinned against someone else, you know, whoever it is, you know, in our own self-righteousness, we can deal with the, 
you know, I told you so, the kind of look, or the angry look, or the hurt look, we expected it, we can deal with it. But when the Lord look upon us, when the Lord turn and look upon us with that pure, sincere love, you know, it robs us of all our self-righteousness and force us to see that, you know, this is what the thing that we have rejected. We actually have rejected the holy love of God. We can't bear to see Jesus look at us with such love. To see that we have failed Him time and time again. We can't bear for Him to see us as such failures. And like Peter, we turn our face away from Jesus and we weep that bitterly. Jesus has risen from the dead, but Peter was having mixed feelings. I mean, sure, you know, on one hand, he's really happy to see Jesus. But on the other hand, you know, he's ashamed, he's disappointed, he's disappointed at himself because he's betrayed Jesus Christ. He's scared. Maybe in his mind, you know, maybe he's thinking about, about what Jesus did after he was resurrected. Jesus met with, with Mary Magdalene. He met with all the women, but he didn't meet with me. You know, I rushed down to the tomb after they, they told us that he was there, but he wasn't there. Jesus met with these two other disciples who were heading towards Emerus. These are not the primarily, the, you know, the main core of disciples, just two other guys, you know. But he didn't meet with me. And then Jesus appeared to the disciples twice and he, Jesus talked to all of them and G, but Peter was just part of the crowd. In fact, one of these uh, encounters, Jesus actually appeared to talk to Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas and talk to Thomas more than he did to Peter. So the question is, you know, what about me? You know, what about me? Was Jesus disappointed at Peter? Was Jesus no longer Peter's rabbi, uh, his friend, his mentor, his confidant, his lord? You know, all these things are crowding in his mind. Maybe that's why he decided to go fishing, you know, because something that's familiar to him, something comfortable, something he's good at, and maybe as Peter fished, you know, he wasn't really fishing for, for, for really fishes, but it was to leave all these thoughts, all these of Jerusalem to leave all the negative experience that he had of, of the Last Supper, the, the arrest, the charcoal fire, his denial of Christ, to leave perhaps even the cross, the empty tomb, the house with the locked doors and Jesus' word, peace be with you, because there is no peace in his heart. And so Peter fished. And as he fished, he was fishing for answers. You know, what have I done? Who really is Jesus Christ? What are these years of my life, these three years of my life for following Christ for? Where is Jesus now? What do I do? Where do I go from here? Who am I? Peter was looking and seeking for meaning in his life, for a purpose to move forward when the future is so uncertain. And so the disciples, they fished all night. They caught nothing. And the thing is, we need to point out here is that, you know, Peter and the disciples, they were experienced fishermen. And the Sea of Tiberias is an amazing fishing spot, by the way. You know, people have fished there for thousands of years. And underneath this, this okay, it's called Sea of Tiberias or Sea of Galilee, but actually it's a lake. But underneath this lake, there's actually a lot of underground springs, you know, that, that's, that feed into it and the water that comes out from these underground springs are warmer and so there's a lot of uh, algae, algae, algae and there's a lot of fish okay and Peter and the disciples they were there at the right time you know it's the early hours before sunrise they had the right equipment I won't go into detail on that but they really plan out uh, they have all the nets compound nets they have sufficient boats they, they got able to make uh, a mesh and all these things okay but they did everything right. They had the experience and everything, but there was no fish in their nets. There was no answer for what they are going through. Okay. 
and then Jesus appears. Oh. You know, I, I just love the way the, the scripture kind of introduced Jesus' entrance into the scene. You know, verse 4, this is what it reads. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And I can just imagine Jesus standing at the shore, you know, and he's close by the water. And as the first rays of the sun was just beaming up from behind him, so the disciples can't really make up his face, you know, except for his silhouette. And he said this, Children, do you have any fish? Now this was not a question, okay? Jesus knew, okay, they had no fish in their nets. And Jesus knew as well that in their hearts, they are empty. They had reached the limit of their capabilities. They have reached the limit of their self-sufficiency. The disciples, like their nets, they were empty. And Jesus just told them, cast your net on the right side of the boat. They did, and Jesus filled those nets. It was a miracle, 153 fishes. It was so full, the disciples were not able to pull them the fishes into their boats. And the moment that Peter heard that it is the Lord, Peter jumped into the water without hesitation. And then the other disciples, they, they follow in the boat, you know, still pulling on the, the net full of fish. And I can imagine Jesus just standing there, smiling, you know, as he sees his beloved friends hauling in the net full of fish. And then Peter just swimming towards him. And this was because Jesus has done this before. You know, three years ago, he caught the attention of this man with a dramatic catch of fish. And together they start a ministry in Galilee. I will teach you to be fishers of men. And then they left their boats, they left everything and, and followed him. And here and now through this miracle, Jesus is refreshing their memory and got their attention. And Peter knew it was Jesus. And so he's swimming with all his might, you know, 100 yards, 90, 80. Peter was swimming towards the one who can heal all his memories, the one who can rewrite the terrible images and sounds of his past. And then Jesus stood over the same charcoal fire where in John 18, Peter once stood with the servants and denied Christ. Now as the disciples near the land, they saw bread and, and fish already laid out on the charcoal fire and they had a very quiet breakfast. And no one there to talk. The disciples were probably thinking about the last supper that they had with Jesus before he was taken away from them, taken away from them and crucified. And today, this is the first breakfast they had with the Lord. Now, after the meal, Jesus turned to Peter and he spoke to him before the other disciples. You now, Peter may have been dreading this very moment. You know, he could imagine Jesus uh, asking, you know, Peter, why do you deny me? Why do you betray me? But our Lord had too much compassion to do so. A bruised wheat he will not break, a faintly burning wick he will not quench. And our Lord's purpose was to remove the guilt, remove the shame, and to cut out the ache and pain in Peter's heart. So Jesus asked instead, he asked, and he, he said this, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? More than what? More than fishing? No, actually I believe that this refers to Peter's bragging in the upper room when he said in, in Matthew 26, 35, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. He was referring to Peter's claim that he loved Jesus more than the other disciples. But when Jesus was arrested, what did Peter actually do? He rejected Christ three times. You know, we all like to talk big about dying for the Lord. But the truth is sometimes we are not ready. We won't know until that moment comes. When the rubber hits the road, 
of us we may fall. You know, yes, Lord, I'm willing to die for you, but not so soon. I'll die for you, Lord, when it's convenient. I'll die for you when people are watching. We all talk big about dying for the Lord, but the Lord knows our heart. And here Jesus was addressing this in Peter's heart. He's asking, do you still claim to love me more than the other disciples? And Peter's reply was very simple. He didn't elaborate. He didn't compare himself with others. He just said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That's it. Peter has, through this whole experience, has learned what true humility is and realized that he's not as strong as he thought he was. And then God, or rather Jesus, gave him the simple instruction to feed his sheep. Yeah, and this was a symbolic way of telling Peter to teach God's word to his followers. And then Jesus asked the same question again and again, a total of three times, and three times Jesus, uh, Peter gave the same response. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus knew that Peter loved him. But Jesus was giving Peter the opportunity to profess his love his love out loud three times before the charcoal fire, just as he had denied Jesus three times. So as to revisit these painful memories, but also to overcome them by the gracious forgiveness of Christ. Peter's biggest problem, it wasn't that he denied Christ three times. Peter was restored and reinstated as the chief apostle and disciple of Jesus Christ. We knew that. So the biggest problem isn't that we fail or that we turn or, or that we deny Jesus. Peter's biggest problem was that he wept alone and then he turned away from God. He turned his face away from Jesus. He turned away to fish. And then he, all he had was an empty net to show. No answer to be found within the nets that he thought would be able to give him comfort and solace. And that's our biggest problem as well. You know, our biggest problem is we look away from Jesus Christ. Our biggest problem is that when we fail God, when we sin and we need comfort and reassurance instead of turning to our Lord Jesus Christ, we turn to the things of this world for comfort. We turn to our hobbies, we turn to our addictions, we turn to our worldly pursuit of things, and we came up, we come up with empty nets and empty hearts. Jesus said, cast your net to the right side of the boat and move out of sin into his righteousness, to move out of death into life as we see and proclaim, it is the Lord. Our nets will then be full of fish and our hearts will be fuller because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he stands able, willing to forgive us, to restore us to him. Our lives, you know, moving on forward, yes, our lives will still be, we, still be, we will still be sinning. We will still fail him. But Jesus kept looking up, looking on to us. He looked at us as he was arrested, as he was led to the Calvary. He looked at us as he was hanging on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He looked at us when he was standing there by the shore and he asked us, Children, have you caught any fish? Do you still want to turn your back on him? Or are we, or will we run, run towards the one who can heal our memories? The one who can rewrite the terrible images and sounds of our past, of our sins and our failures. You know, a uh, few years ago, Jesus stood on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he looked at this, this unseemly fisherman called Simon. Skin was dark, it was rough exterior, he had a bad temper, he had the salt of the sea on his skin and on his hair. And there was a smell of fish all around him. That very day, Jesus called on him and said, Follow me. And three years later, 
after all the drama of the healing, the miracle, the crowds, the Pharisees, the raising of the, of the people from the dead, the chasing away of the demons, the torture, the betrayal, the death, the resurrection, Jesus is back here on the same shore on the Sea of Galilee. He was looking at the same young man, okay, not that young anymore, but the same fisherman with his dark skin, with his rough exterior, with the salt of the sea on his face and his hair, the smell of fish around him. But perhaps there was a softening of his face that revealed a heart of humility, a heart that is now full of contentment and joy. And on that day, Jesus recalled this same fisherman with the same words. Follow me. Jesus has restored Peter. And today, you know, Jesus has restored us. You know, by the work of his death on the cross and resurrection, our past sin and failures have been forgotten and, 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 and forgiven. This is a new beginning and a new moment for all of us. Because just as how Peter has been restored and recalled to follow Jesus, so Jesus called on us now and here to follow him. Today, will you follow him? Will you remember how God first called you to be his son, his daughter? Can you remember your journey with him through the years, through the decades? Will you recommit your life to him today? Will you follow him? Because that's the only way that you will get your nets full. That's where you will have the greatest satisfaction in life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us, for reaching out to us, even though we have turned away, even though we sin, even though we fail you, even though we have doubts. But your love is unconditional, your grace immeasurable. You fill our nets, you fill our hearts, you give purpose to our life. And this is the O oh Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to confess that we love you and help us to love the people around you. Our family, our people, which you have given to us. Because this is your will for us, even as we follow you. And in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for the, for the government's initiative implementing the circuit breaker. We, we know this is to stop the spread of COVID-19. We know that as individuals, as family unit, it's hard to stay home all the time. But we know it's necessary to protect the lives of the people that we love. Please give us temperance as we respond in love with one another within the home. Let us use this season to build good memories, to deepen our relationship with one another. You are our Father and you love us immensely. When tension rises, when fear grips us, help us to look not into our past sins and behavior, but look to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Lord, I thank, give thanks for the many who have came for the online Thursday prayer meeting through Zoom and also for the Women of Worth meeting on Friday. We trust that you have been working continuously in the hearts of many, convicting many to surrender their time so as to meet, as to worship you, and to encourage one another with prayers and with their presence. May you continue to protect our healthcare workers in Singapore, even as they labour day after day. Let them enter to your rest and continue to trust your promises. Father, we also pray for the migrant workers, the homeless here in Singapore. Please. Please have mercy on them for the situation they are, they are in is devastating and we ourselves, we are limited in what we can do to help. Please Lord, give wisdom to the authorities that a solution can be found so as to protect them to the best of our abilities. Lord, this is a dry season as we are unable to come to the church to worship as a community. 
I pray that this will create in us a thirst and hunger for the physical presence of, of one another and for the presence of you as well, Lord. And this Easter, draw us, Lord, and keep our eyes on you, for you are the true satisfaction of our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.